than traditional diamonds, than natural diamonds. So there's some big changes happening. We're, we're live. Okay, fantastic. Hi, welcome. Okay, good evening, everybody, and good evening, those of you joining us on YouTube. Thank you for waiting. If you were uh, here at 6 o'clock, we had a couple of technical issues that uh, took us a minute to overcome. We're excited to be with you tonight to share with you about the art of jewelry design. Now, when somebody thinks about going to get a jewelry design made, it's not very clear very often what it takes to go from a concept in your mind all the way to a finished piece of jewelry. And so tonight we're going to share with you the entire process from imagination to creation. So how you can come up with concepts, how you can do creative variation, and then what happens when you send that into the factory to have it be produced. This is a session that's going to be run by Tanya Sedow. Tanya is the dean and founder of JDMIS. Tanya has been in the jewelry industry for over 40 years and has worked in every facet of the jewelry industry. So from um, manufacturing, she's a, a, a manufacturing jeweler, uh, to design, she's an award-winning designer, she's worked in wholesale and retail of gemstones, um, and sort of every other aspect of the business. So she's got a lot of uh, insight to share as to how um, this works at every stage of the process. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm just going to be doing the introduction today, but if you join us for some other sessions, I will be sharing with you more about the things that I'm really good at. Now, before I start with the session itself, I'd like to let you know a little bit more about the school, JDMIS. And the easiest way for me to do that, instead of being here talking to you, is to play a short two-minute video that explains who we are here at JDMIS. Since I just wanted to mention that this is part of a gem jamming series. Those of you that have joined us for the first time um, might not know that we actually run this series every week. Uh, we have sessions with gem spotlights where you can learn more about specific gemstones. We have sessions on designing and manufacturing using new technologies, using traditional technologies. And we also have some interesting sessions on things that are useful for you to know as uh, a jewelry buyer, like how to care for your jewelry, and also useful for you to know if you're in the industry. For example, what's happening with synthetic diamonds and are they a worthwhile investment? So with that, I'm going to now um, move on to who we are here at JDMIS. Since 2007, the Jewelry Design and Management International School has given thousands of people the confidence to create quality jewelry. Established in Singapore, in the heart of Southeast Asia, JDMIS has conducted courses for some of the world's most distinguished jewelry companies, as well as passionate amateurs and those ready for a career in the jewelry industry. Specializing in the jewelry arts, JDMIS provides exceptional education in jewelry design, fabrication, gemology, and business. The tools that students receive from JDMIS on their first day have traveled with many along the road of jewelry making success. Tanya Sedow, founder of the JDMIS, is an award-winning jewelry designer and renowned jewelry educator with over 30 years of experience training the jewelry industry. Tanya, with her team of expert jewelry artists and instructors, created the JDMIS curriculum to be comprehensive yet flexible. Small class sizes, personalized attention, and an unmatched support network ensure that each participant leaves with the knowledge, skill, and confidence to succeed in the jewelry industry. Designed for the jewelry trade, training at JDMIS is fast-paced and packed with useful practical information. But with a diverse range of participants, courses are also great fun. Learning at their own pace, participants study the latest information about gemstones and jewelry styles. They gain confidence using the best of traditional and contemporary techniques and learn how to apply each of these skills to their businesses. All JDMIS courses are completely modular and they can be taken individually. For each skill they learn, students receive a certificate and can combine these skills to receive a comprehensive diploma qualification. Graduates in more than 42 countries delight friends and relatives with their unique creations. 
Many graduates showcase their pieces online, and JDMAS's brightest stars operate their own successful retail jewelry businesses, designing and producing exquisite jewelry that enchants their customers. The possibilities are endless. What will you create? Fantastic. So now let us get on to what is jewelry design and what does it take to be a jewelry designer today and how would we go about it? So basically there are some criteria first of all, um, beauty, durability and comfort. If we're going to design jewelry, we always have to keep those three things in mind. So interestingly, beauty is obviously in the eye of the beholder. What I might find beautiful, you may not. What you might find beautiful, I may not. But in general, when we design something, we have to be excited about it and we have to love it. Because if we love it, the majority of people will love it. If we design something and we're not actually quite sure whether it's nice or not, and we have to ask somebody, then it probably isn't the best design in the world. But I, frankly speaking, nobody has such bad taste. Usually if you love it, if you would wear it, if you would be proud to be seen in it, then beauty is probably not an issue. Durability. We expect our jewelry to last. We expect to wear it many times, and we expect to even hand it down to our sons and our daughters after we've enjoyed it. Right? It's, it's one of these things that people buy jewelry for investment. People love to feel that you know, they're handing down something valuable to their sons and daughters. And when we design the jewelry, we want to make sure that it is going to last for a long time. So when we draw, we have limitations. Our limitations are usually never draw something that's too thin because it's likely to dent or it's likely to break. Um, another thing we need to make sure that it's not heavy. If we make it too thick or if we make it too heavy, then comfort comes into it. And when we look at comfort, we want our jewelry to be comfortable. An uncomfortable piece of jewelry is never going to be worn. If you make something that, let's say, it's too uncomfortable on the ear, it might be worn once, but then it'll go straight into the jewelry box and nobody's ever going to take it out again because they will remember every time they open the jewelry box, they remember it's uncomfortable and that's where it sits. And as a jewelry designer, I want people to see what I'm making. I want people to look at it and say, wow, that's fabulous. Where did you buy that? And I want my name to come up. And if it's inside the jewelry box, it's not going to happen. So the more comfortable a piece of jewelry is, the more likely it will be worn and the better that is for the designer as well. So those are our criteria. It needs to be beautiful, it needs to be durable, and it needs to be comfortable, which are criteria that we wouldn't have if we were looking at painting something, or you know, maybe in fashion, yes, we would have it, but in, in just an ordinary painting, we wouldn't need to worry. So other things that we have to think about, not just aesthetic values, yes, but technical skill. And every jewelry designer has to have some idea of how a piece of jewelry is actually made. And today we have all these new technologies that help us to make things faster, that help us to make things better, lighter weight, etc. So there's a lot of ways that we can make jewelry. And if we know more about the technical skills, the uh, making portion, it makes it much easier for us to be good designers. We know, also need to know a little bit about the materials involved. Where are those materials from? How can they combine together nicely? And things like that. Here I have a very famous uh, drawing by somebody who you probably know. This is an artist that was Dutch uh, from the 1920s, 1930s. His name was Escher. And we had a big exhibition here in Singapore just before COVID happened. Some of you might have been to that exhibition and seen some of his works. Fabulous things. He seems to be able to somehow defy gravity and draw stuff that we know is impossible. But with a pencil and a piece of paper, 
you could draw anything. When we are making a piece of jewelry, we have to make sure it's going to work. We have to make sure it's wearable. We cannot just draw a pretty picture and hope that somehow that's going to be wearable. So it's not quite as easy as drawing. And I'm not saying that's an easy drawing, but there are lots of things that we have to make sure are in place, because if we are drawing pretty pictures that can't be made, then we're just wasting our time. So that being said, we're very lucky. We have many places we can go for inspiration. Um, since the beginning of time, nature has been a great inspiration for jewelry. In fact, the very first jewelry goes back to about 82,000 BCE. That's before we had anything, before we had clothing. It's before we had lawyers, dentists, before we had architects. We were already making stuff to wear to adorn ourselves. So nature has been a big part of it. Art, all kinds of art can influence us and we can do interesting things with new types of art today. Architecture, of course, history, as we mentioned. And even things that you might not think about, sports, fantasy. Yes, we can, we can still draw dragons and we can still make beautiful little dragons and little, little things that are fantastical things. Animals use geometry or, or any kind of these kind of things for inspiration. And that means that we can really get inspiration from many, many places. Plus, if you add to the mix that we also have traditional cultures, we have popular cultures and global economy that can influence us greatly. That's very interesting. Um, traditional cultures might depend uh, which gems and metals we use. I don't know if you are aware, but there are certain cultures that do not allow men to wear gold, right? So what about where the pieces might be worn or what type of symbolic significance they have? So all of these things are things that we can tap into and help us to inspire us to create lots of lovely things. We can even make sure that we ask our customer what they like, right? It's simple. You find out with jewelry magazines, with trade journals, you can show your customer, do you like this? Do you like that? What is the size you're looking for? What is the color you're looking for? Is it a ring? Is it a pendant? Is it a brooch? And so if we have a, a good understanding of our customers' likes and dislikes, then that makes it quite easy for us to go ahead and design something nice for our customer. So that works quite nicely. But what if you're told to sit down and work as a jewelry designer and produce designs during the day? So you have to sit there and all day long come up with new designs. How easy do you think that would be? Because some people think that we just sit and wait, and then suddenly we get struck by inspiration and we start drawing, all right? It's not quite like that. So inspiration for jewelry designers might come from everywhere and every, anywhere, but coming up with instant designs is not something that easy. So I'm going to show you now how it's done for us to be drawing all day long. One of the ways for idea generation is, of course, never copying a design, but is something that we call tracing. And when I talk about tracing, a lot of people say, oh, but tracing is just you put your tracing paper and you trace something that's already there. OK, that's what you learn in kindergarten. You learn how to trace something. But when we talk about tracing, we don't use it to copy. We use it to combine in all kinds of different ways to generate new ideas, which is much easier than just kind of waiting for the inspiration to hit us. So if we look at what tracing really is, tracing is duplication of shapes or patterns. Here you see a little bird that's been duplicated many times, but in each case, the tail of the bird has changed. So that is already tracing. Now, that's not somebody else's bird. That's my bird. But I like the look of the bird. And then I redid my bird 10 times over and put a different tail each time to see which one came out the best and which one looked better. So yes, it is a way of copying something. But we must really be very clear 
on that we don't want to copy other people's work because we know that copying is unethical and it's not something that we need or even have to do. So let's have a look at how many designs could be made. How many designs do you think we could make a day? Does anybody have any idea? I mean, imagine being a jewelry designer, sitting in an office, and you're told, make jewelry. How many drawings do you think you would be able to do a day? Just anyone. 50? OK, 50 is good. Eight. Eight? Was that eight? Yeah. OK, eight. It wouldn't last very long. Yes, you'd be out of a job very, very quickly. But never mind, we'll go through and I'll show you how we can do a lot of designs a day. So first of all, the idea is that we take an idea from different sources and then we combine them together. All right. So what happens is I might like an element of one design and an element of another design. I'll trace a little bit of this and I'll trace a little bit of that and I will combine them together but the combination of those two now looks nothing like either this original or that original. It's going to look entirely different, all right? And that is one of the ways to work the fastest. So if we, um, if we do it with tracing, not only can we be very creative, but we can be very productive. We can produce as many as 100 designs a day this way. Now, those are just concepts. They're not finished designs, but at least we have a hundred concepts. And out of those hundred concepts, we might find five really good ones, or we might find five of them that we want to take to the next level and make them brilliant. But imagine if you're only doing five a day. If you're only doing five a day, then how many of those are going to be great designs? Chances are not many. So some are going to be discarded doesn't matter as long as you keep going keep putting things on paper because what you see up here and what other people see nobody can see what you have up here so this is why it has to be put on the paper and the excellent the excellent designs will come the more you draw the better your designs will come and the more you will produce and the more successful designs you will get so Tracing is the easiest starting point for anybody. In fact, anybody can trace. Let's face it, we know in kindergarten we learn how to trace. So anyone here could trace. It's very, very simple. One of the things that we highly recommend at the beginning is to do irregular shapes, something that's asymmetrical. Don't try to do symmetrical designs because if you're going to do symmetry, it's got to be really accurate. And accuracy at the beginning is very hard. So when you've got a little bit of practice with tracing and you know what you're doing and you understand it, then definitely symmetrical designs are in. But initially, it's easier to do asymmetric designs. And you'll get some very interesting shapes coming from these. So we said never, never trace an entire design. Very, very important. You're just a small part of one, a small part of the other put them together and create something brand new. And when you do that, you'll be able to do it super fast eventually. So we can trace from uh, magazines. People think, oh, we need to trace from jewelry magazines. Actually, we don't need to trace from jewelry magazines. Better if you didn't have a jewelry magazine. You could trace from absolutely any magazine, food, um, clothing, you name it, any place, anywhere. So we're going to look at this now, the creative process, and see how we get started. So what I selected here, I selected the picture of a lady in a magazine. And you can see that this lady is wearing a white shirt. And I just decided to trace the shirt. And you can see on the left-hand side, the tracing, it's just a line drawing of the shirt. Now, when you look at that, it really doesn't look very interesting. And everyone might be thinking, what on earth piece of jewelry could I possibly make from a white shirt? Yes, it's a very interesting question. All right, so what I did then is I took another piece of jewelry and I decided to sketch a little bit of the jewelry, not the whole piece, but just the little leaves. And you can see over there, I'm sketching the leaves. Then 
I took that shirt, which was the original thing I drew or traced, I rotated it, and I kind of saw that it almost looked like a little head of an animal. And then I flipped it in a different direction with my tracing paper just flipping it across. So now I can see clearly the head of the animal and possibly even the body of the animal or the, the little creature. And then I added the second sketch or the second tracing of the sketch to the first one. And this was the beginnings of the duck. So when I add a couple more lines and I add a few more gemstones, we suddenly have a very cute little duck which could be a nice brooch, right? So you can still see that it originated from the shirt and some leaves. And there we have a design. Now here's another example. This was a cover of a magazine. It was the love issue. And so I liked the letters. I thought the letters, the script was very beautiful. And so I traced the letter. This was the letter T or the letter I. I think one was the T and one was the I. And I thought, what can I do with the letter T and the letter I? So then I kind of flipped them around and then I repeated them over and over again. And you can see here, I'm now working on a link bracelet and I've got a pin, a brooch, where I have put all of the letters into a radial design. And I've also even got a pendant where I did a Im mirror image for the actual uh, T uh, or I letter. So very quickly, remember, concept is just concepts, putting concepts on paper, but it's very, very fast. So this is done in literally minutes. So we go back to our duck. And I then decided to take the letters and create the tail for the duck. So I have a new tail for my duck. Why not? I might like it, I might not like it. Then I found another picture of a, of a very nice bracelet. And I took a little portion of that bracelet, which you can see directly underneath. And I took my initial duck and I added some gemstones to the leaves. I flipped the leaves and I even made a reduction in the leaves. So we can make things bigger, we can make things smaller. And on this side, I added that extra piece to my duck. And so now I have a duck with a completely different tail. So I'm beginning to get a whole family of ducks here, which is a whole, you know, a whole trend, a whole line or a theme which is coming about. And you can see here how all my ducks are getting on with all the different tails that I can invent on the ducks. So little by little, by adding all of these things together, all the ones that we create and coming up with new ones and new pendants and new designs. And now I've got some lips at the top there. Those were lips of a model on the front page of a magazine. What could I do with the lips? I can actually create some interesting things with those. And you can see where those lips have been repeated throughout the design, either rotated or mirror imaged. And we end up with 50 to 100 designs a day. So if you look at that, you'll see that about eight hours, if we do about 13 designs in eight hours, we can get 104 designs in a day. And that would be what's expected from a jewelry designer. Um, if you are doing less than that, they would wonder, you know, you're not really make, you're not really very productive. So they would maybe have second chance, second thoughts about hiring somebody who doesn't produce a lot. Now we, we said not all of them are great. Not all of them are fantastic designs, but it's not up to the designer what's going to be good. It's entirely up to the person who is going to manufacture those pieces to look at it and say, hey, I see potential in this, or I see potential in that. I have some gemstones for this design that would work really well. So let's take this design and let's take it to the next level and do a lot more variations on it. So that's basically how we would go about um, the creative aspect of it. Now, once the uh, manufacturer has selected a design and if the manufacturer says yes I want to take this to the next level then we need to be accurate why because in order to make the piece of jewelry 
we have to be very precise. We're working with gold, we're working with precious gems. If we make a mistake, that mistake can be very, very costly. And it could eat into all of the profits that are ever made. So if you're going to do uh, accurate drawing, then we're talking about what's called a top side and end view, and we're talking about drafting techniques. So the design will go to the next stage. And here we're gonna show you how we go about drawing some rings in front of a customer. We put the finger size, we maybe add the gemstone, which is maybe our customer's gemstone, and we ask the, the customer, how do they like this? Do you like it with some stones? Do you like it without some stones? Do you want an asymmetric design? Do you want a symmetrical design? And maybe the customer says, yeah, I like the asymmetric design. So from there, we have to draw this extremely accurately, which means that the size is important, the customer's finger size. We have to make sure that we have lengths and widths. They're very carefully laid out. We draw the stone, the actual size as well, so all the gems are gonna be actual size. And when we've done the top view, which gives us all lengths and widths, then we come down to the view directly underneath, which is called the side view. The side view is giving us all the heights. So we know if the stone is going to sit nicely in place or whether it's gonna come through and touch the finger or not touch the finger. And we are able to see um, that from one direction we may not see the gems and from the other direction we may see gems. So after we've done a side view, we then go to our next one, which is called the end view. And the end view also gives us heights. It gives us um, another measurement from the top view. So you see all of these are very related one to another. I'm moving from one to the other so that all of our measurements are aligned and um, there is a, a correspondence, corresponding measurements between them. And I'm doing another side view here because the side view on this side is gonna show some gemstones that we didn't see on the other side. So this is how we would go about drawing something accurately. We draw it with drafting and we make sure that all our measurements are correct and that when we create it, when we make it, we can take all of our measurements directly off this kind of, um, yes, question? We had a couple of uh, questions. Uh, okay. Maybe this is a good time for them. Sure. Uh, the first question was, can you explain the importance of hand sketching at the initial stage of the design? And why do people not just go straight to doing this? OK, so I don't know if everyone heard the question, but um, what is the importance of hand sketching? And why don't we just go directly to this? Um, the hand sketching is much faster. It's much more fluid. And we are able to do, as we said, 50 to 100 in a day. We can do it very, very quickly. This one, we can't do 50 to 100 of them in a day. This one really requires understanding all of the different directions and it has to be extremely accurate. So the difference between just a hand sketch and this is a hand sketch is, is faster, it's um, less accurate, whereas this one is super accurate and much slower to do, but very important for the manufacturer. So, and I, I might add something to that one, yeah. which is that generally speaking, somebody's gonna have to decide if it's worth you doing this. So as a designer, if you're the one making the decision, you have this thing in your mind and you know you wanna get it out, then that's fine, you could jump straight to this. But if somebody else is gonna have to look at it, let's say a customer or uh, you know, a team leader or something like that, then you need something quick to be able to convince them that it's worth going through this uh, step. And I'm sorry, there was one more question, yeah. which was, why is it that you do it in one-to-one? -one? Why don't you do it like architects in one-to-one-hundred or one-hundred-to-one, -one, or why don't you zoom in or zoom right. out? So the reason we have to do one-to-one -one, uh, is twofold. Uh, first of all, what you see is what you get. You will see the gemstone, you will see the size of the gemstone, when you design something bigger, and it might look absolutely magnificent when you see it in very large size, but then you go to make it, and it is made smaller, and when the customer then sees it, 
you open the box and they look inside and they're like, oh my gosh, that's so much smaller than I expected it to be. There is a disappointment factor, right? We don't want to be disappointing our customers. You show them a beautiful large picture, you go, oh, this is going to be $300. Fantastic. They go away thinking that $300 is like this big. It's bigger than anywhere they've seen. And then when they come and get it, they realize, oh, it's actually much smaller than I anticipated. So we don't want to disappoint people. Um, on top of which, if some people like to draw small, which I know in architecture you have to draw small. There's no, there's no other choice, right? <laughs> but if we draw smaller, we have another issue that comes up. And that is if I'm drawing a, a design, and let's say I have a diamond that is three points. Three points is really tiny. We're talking about $10, $15. Then I zoom it up and I make it into the actual size by enlarging my design. It's also going to enlarge everything in the design. Suddenly my three point diamond becomes a three carat diamond. <laughs> and you know, is a three carat diamond affordable? Most people wouldn't be buying a three carat diamond, maybe. So it's just less of a headache for us if we draw it actual size, and it makes sure that the customer knows that that's what it's going to look like at the end. It's not going to be bigger. It's not going to be smaller. Yeah. OK. So moving on, we can then go one step further. Designers also do um, render. Rendering is where we add color to the design so that it makes it more beautiful. Maybe this is more of an aspect for a customer than it's for a manufacturer. Quite frankly, manufacturer does not need to see a pretty picture. Manufacturer needs to see top side and end view with the measurements. He can actually measure directly from your piece of paper what it's going to look like. So he doesn't need color. But coloring is done for competitions. Coloring is done for customers. So we don't need a lot of equipment when we design. We've got some some interesting pencils and templates. Sometimes we use gemstones that we can be inspired by. Um, we sometimes also have things like charts that we might go to to assess the weights of certain gemstones. Sometimes we look at jewelry as well to see settings. You can see these kinds of charts. There's a lot of different types of charts that we might need because different gems have different specific gravities, different weights. So when we start, and here's a very good example. You see there's a design underneath this. I'm only tracing one element from that design. Now I'm coming to another piece, a different design, and I'm going to trace one element from that design. I never trace an entire design. I would just trace two little things. Now that we have this, I take a second piece of tracing paper. I'm going to go ahead and highlight it so I can see it really well. And once I can see it, then we are going to retrace it again onto another piece of paper. So as we retrace it, now we can flip it into the opposite direction. And we now have the beginnings of maybe something that's a nice neck piece, a nice necklace. And so now we have these two sections that are quite symmetrical. And we're going to put a gemstone hanging from the center of these two. So let's draw a gemstone. And as we draw the gemstone, we can decide what shape we want our gemstone. Maybe a nice pear shape would fit very nicely in that particular design. Gems have very specific length to width ratios. It's not that we can just draw any gemstone anyhow in any shape or any size. Because at the end of the day, the gems also have to be set into mountings. And not all the mountings are made individually. Not today. If you make it every single thing by hand, it's going to cost a lot more than anybody else is costing their jewelry. So we have to be competitive. So once we've got the right length to width ratio and we put some facets, we can decide which direction to put the stone. We could put it facing up. We could put it with a point facing down. We will trace it. We will set it in the setting. And here's another option, is instead of the pear-shaped faceted stone, we could also put a bezel set round stone as well, with a few extra diamonds around. So this is a painting there. These are colored pencils. 
Many years ago, there was no other option than just painting jewelry. Today, colored pencils are the way to go because it's cleaner and it's faster. We can paint, but it just takes too long. You'd get maybe one or two designs painted a day, whereas with colored pencils, you can easily do eight to 10 designs colored in a day. So our white pencil is the first one we would use to put what we call the highlight areas. So we would kind of put all of those raised areas with the white pencil. We need to blend it all out nicely. Some areas are gonna be more intense and some areas less intense. Once we've done that, we come with our yellow pencil. We can add the body color, say this is maybe gold. It could be 14 karat or 18 karat. It doesn't really matter. You're not gonna see the difference in a drawing whether it's 14 or 18 karat. And once we have that body color, then we can add a little bit of brown to make certain areas look as if they're rounding further away from you. It gives more depth to the design. So once we've blended all of that in nicely, then we can think about the gems. And this one has a ruby. We're gonna put a nice cabochon ruby here. You also have a highlight area. You also have shading. And then we have to make sure everything is totally blended. The better blended, the more smooth and the better it looks. And we can also add the bezel. Now that bezel looks very white there. We're gonna make it into a yellow bezel by letting it dry and then highlighting it with the yellow pen. The diamonds are gonna stay nice and bright and white. The settings, there might be white settings for the diamonds because they're white and a few little facets here and there. Something like this takes no more than 10 minutes to produce, yeah. So here you see a finished one with the faceted stone, maybe an emerald and the other one with the ruby. So as I was saying, um, manufacturers, they don't need color. For a manufacturer, we can just simply draw it out nicely and make sure it's highlighted in the black ink. Competitions, competitions, we want to make sure that we do lots of color and give some, you know, volume to the pieces. So there's a lot of different aspects to drawing jewelry. There's a lot of different ways we can do it. Uh, a lot of things that we need to really look at to understand to make sure that when we're drawing that the drawings are going to come out really well. Um, there's that quick generation um, creation with uh, just by hand and then there's the accurate drawing which takes a little bit longer in different in different views. Yes. Okay, so very good question. Are we always drawing with a stone when we go to, actually no, we're not. Um, sometimes if it's round, round comes in practically any size, so we can always throw a round stone in wherever we want to do so. We have cabochons, which have no facets, and then of course we have our faceted stones, which are different ones. We also have carvings. So if you're gonna do something unusual like a carving, it's always better to have the carving and to outline it in its actual size and to try to draw it as accurately as it, as it will be. But when it comes to faceted stones, uh, generally speaking, we look at the length to width ratios and whether we have the stone or we don't have the stone, we stick to those so that we will have the ease of setting that stone once the design is done. And finding that stone. So and, and finding it, yes, and finding it. There, exactly. You don't have the stone picked yet, but you're yes. working with the so, as a good example, um, if you were to draw any sized stone, and it was a very unusual stone, it was a very beautiful stone, and your customer saw it and said, wow, that's fantastic, I want that, and it's my wedding anniversary in two weeks, I want to give that to my wife. So two weeks is about enough time to make the piece and be able to present it to your customer on time for the anniversary. That would be about the minimum time required to make a piece of jewelry. But if your gemstone is a very unusual stone, 
then the first thing we would have to do is probably fly to Bangkok and go and have them specially cut it. It's going to take them two weeks to specially cut the stone. They're not going to stop everything they're doing and do your stone. They're going to you know, do it in their stride. And when you have the stone, then you can start on the actual piece of jewelry. So you probably need another two weeks after that. So if you just stick to your length to width ratios, everything is like clockwork, it'll be done, and your cost is going to be a reasonable cost. It won't be including your flight to Bangkok, including the extra cutting and including everything else, which nobody wants to pay for. Let's face it, yeah. And there is one person in the world that can actually design whatever they want, however they want. And that person is really famous and very well known in our industry. His name is Jar. That's his initials, J-A-R. You can look him up on the internet. Uh, he's one of the most famous jewelry designers in the world. People line up to get his designs and he doesn't design for everybody. He will look at you and he will decide if he's going to design something for you. And when he designs for you, it is going to be what he decides, not what you decide. <laughs> so when you get to that level, then you can draw any gemstone you want to. But beyond that, no, I think we all have to stick to our length to width ratios. Yes, question. So we had a question from Clara about uh, tips on sketching without feathering lines. Do you have any tips on sketching um, without feathering lines? Yes. Number one, use a pencil that is very thin and very sharp. We usually use a, a 2H lead. We never use uh, an HB lead to create our uh, sketches because HB is a little bit more messy um, and it tends to um, it smudges and it, it's not very clean. So we use a 2H and um, make sure your hand is always comfortable. You know, one of the most difficult things for people is when they're trying to draw and they try to draw around corners or they try, you've got to be able to have the space to rotate your piece and to be able to turn it 360 degrees so that your hand is always comfortable. The hand should be sitting comfortably on the table so that you have support. And if you can do that, and you do it slowly and carefully, then there's no reason why you would have any feathering lines. Great, and I guess you probably also answered the questions, the, the other question, which was, how do you sketch more conf confidently? I suppose by not moving your hand, by moving the paper. Okay, that's there's, a, there's a much faster, three words. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> that's the only way to do it quickly and do it really well. It is going to require, it's a skill. It's, every skill requires a lot of practice. So that's, there's nobody going to do it and hit the ground running that easily. Yeah. All right. So um, hopefully you've understood how we go about it, how we get started, and how you don't really need an art background to do jewelry designing. For our programs, we teach you from literally A to Z. You can go through and learn from uh, tracing, sketching. You learn about major forms. You learn to understand how to draw them in all the different views. Um, you learn how to communicate with the customer. You learn how to communicate with the manufacturer. Uh, all of these things are included. And really, you don't have to have an uh, art background in any way shape or form in fact we've had dentists we've had lawyers we've had people from all walks of life doing the program and then succeeding really well so that being said we now what is it supposed to be questions okay so uh, it looks like that was the question oh, oh, there we go the so we did right. have one other question, uh, which was, hang on a second. It was about uh, traditional jewelry design versus the new digital methods. All right, so digital being CAD and CAM, right? Yep. Okay, so, I, so you, no, no, go ahead, you're welcome go ahead. to, but um, there is always room for both traditional and the new technologies. It, it, I started with the traditional, um, sometimes you know, it's, it's difficult to pick up the new technologies, but it's not impossible. In fact, even for an older person, 
uh, it is very, very simple to pick up CAD and CAM. And there are things that you can do with CAD and CAM that are faster and that are better. Things like symmetrical designs. Oh my gosh, press a button, it'll do the symmetry for you. It'll do the repeating parts for you. It can do things really quickly. But there's nothing like sitting in front of somebody and having a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and drawing on a piece of paper and coming up with ideas because it isn't really fun to be sitting next to a computer and not to be playing with the computer. Because if you are the customer and the designer is just the one on the computer, it can take much longer to come up with your ideas on the computer. And therefore, it's kind of much nicer for customers to be able to do something on the paper quickly with a pencil and do you have anything to add to that one? Well, just that the digital design is most frequently um, a replacement or a supplement to the technical drawing, not to the sketching and the parts at the beginning. The creative part is usually still something you do on, you know, on a piece of paper. It's something you're doing quickly and, and, and making quick changes to. Uh, the technical drawing you can definitely do uh, quite effectively with uh, with digital with tools as well. Absolutely. In fact, um, to do the rings that you saw me do with the top, the side, and the end view, uh, the CAD works really well for that. And if you are able to do it with CAD, that doesn't mean you're able to draw it. But if you're able to draw it, you can probably do it even faster and better with CAD. So it's not, re not really one or the other. I think it's very useful to have both. The more knowledge you have in the area, the better it is, the more you can do with that knowledge. Yes. Any Great. other questions? Are there any other questions? No? It's if actually great fun and something that uh, is attainable and achievable for everyone. Sorry, yes. Mary, if there's time. Have no idea what that looks like in the industry, but is that kind of local benches that you could work with within a city, or is it going to a hub like in Thailand or China? Yes. So you know, Singapore. Or how does that work? Yeah. Okay, so just to explain a little bit about the manufacturing, you make a design, and where do you go? How do you get your design made? Um, so Singapore is not a manufacturing hub. Uh, it's rather expensive because our rentals are very high, uh, even. Um, you know, salaries are fairly high here compared to some surrounding countries. Um, it's probably cheaper to have it done in places like Hong Kong or places like um, Indonesia, Malaysia, for sure. But that doesn't mean we don't have people that do it here. We definitely have people that do it here. We have people that are competent here. We have factories, a small number of factories. Um, we have people that are very happy to work on bespoke products to do one of a kind. And then we have other factories that don't want to work on bespoke, they only want to mass produce. So as long as you find the one that is, is happy to work with you and will work with you, and, and certainly we know uh, many of them here in Singapore that we can introduce you to if that's what you're looking for. And that is also part of the program to let you have those introductions to uh, good people that we know can work with you. Uh, so the ones that do have factories, they can go from literally from beginning to end to make your piece, no problem. They have all of the services, the, the plating services if you need plating or setting of the stones, they will have all of those things here. So it does exist here. Um, it's just a question of what do you need. Uh, we can kind of match you with the right people if you need it. I can add a little more to that as well for those of you that are not so familiar. Um, so, typically, a jewelry designer is not very often the person that's also going to be the jewelry maker. Normally, the designers don't like to get their hands dirty, they like to come up with the concepts, but then somebody else is going to take care of all of the hard work of actually making it. Um, now, that's not always the case, um, but it's quite rare to find a designer that's also a maker. The makers usually don't like designing, and the designers don't always like uh, making. So uh, very often when you see things 
with lots of tiny little gemstones. That's something that the designer is going to send off to a factory and somebody else is going to have to do that because that's really challenging. Right? Setting lots of tiny little gemstones is something that takes decades of experience to get really good at. And the smaller the gemstones, when you're doing things and you're looking at like one millimeter gemstones that somebody's set, um, the effort that's required to do that is substantial. So if you see a designer that's making big pieces, lots of flat surfaces of metal that's relatively easy to polish, that might be the same designer and the same maker that's doing the whole thing themselves. But the more very, very fine detail, the more different people that specialize in those specific things, and therefore the more likely it is that it's going to go to a factory where you've got the stone setter that's been doing that for 20 years, where you've got the polisher that's been doing that for 10 years, uh, where you've got the caster that knows about that particular aspect. Great. Excellent. Any more questions? We don't have any more from online. No? Great. So I'd like to move on. Um, I think I mentioned that this is one of many sessions. So we have sessions that spotlight gemstones, that spotlight um, also, if you're interested in the digital side of things, we have a program that's, uh, we have a, a session that's talking all about how digital jewelry design works. So the same thing you saw Tanya doing, we'll do all in uh, digital tools. Um, and we also have something really interesting that is about how hand fabrication works. So if you want to see what happens when that a technical drawing goes into the factory, how they will cut out the piece of metal, hammer the piece of metal, join the pieces together, do the polishing, all of that stuff. We have a whole session just on that hand fabrication process. Uh, so you're welcome to come back and join us for all of those sessions. And if you are interested in a bit more of a structured way of learning jewelry design in particular, I'd like to share with you one of our most popular courses, which is a blended learning program all about creative drawing. And again, easiest way for me to do this is with a short video rather than just talk over a few slides. Hello and welcome. My name is Tanya Seydow and I'm the Dean and Founder of the Jewelry Design and Management International School. Jewelry Design is by far our most popular program here at JDMIS. When you take Classical Jewelry Design 1, you will get the best foundation in jewelry on which to build your career. During this course, you will get to know about the sparkling industry. You'll learn how to be creative and productive. You'll master basic drawing techniques that will serve you throughout your career. You'll make accurate drawings of gemstones, findings, jewelry pieces that can be used for manufacturing. And you'll discover how to prepare yourself for designing for customers. And then to gain some valuable insight into how jewelry is manufactured to help better appreciate the effort which goes into producing your jewelry designs. A toolkit that contains everything you need to effectively complete the course and a full set of hundreds of pages of color digital handouts and assignments and an entire printed manual. The great news is need our three background. I've trained bankers, lawyers, doctors, and many people from traditionally less creative industries. And I've seen them bloom into award-winning jewelry designers and successful jewelry entrepreneurs. If you're interested in breaking into the jewelry industry as a jewelry designer, then I'm certain this is the course for you. And I look forward to working with you in establishing a solid foundation of skills and knowledge that will help you to find success in this sparkling industry. A Singaporean uh, or a permanent resident, you can actually make use of Skills Future Training Grants, which can cover 50 to 70% of the jewelry training costs. And if you're a Singaporean and you have Skills Future Credits, you can use your Skills Future Credits to further offset any of the remaining course fees. So uh, Singaporeans can really minimize their training costs when they're working with these uh, programs. This is also a blended learning format course. And that's really something that we started doing this year and we've seen being very, very successful. Um, part of it is online and part of it is in the classroom. The online portion you have access to for the rest of your life. It's just you can come back and see all of the steps to doing things and you can come back and refresh your memory on how those things work. But it's not just sitting in front of a computer. It's also coming into class and being able to practice, seeing what mistakes other people are making, 
uh, being able to have the instructor work with you to make sure that you really understand um, what it is that you need to know in order to progress to the next step. So this particular format works really great for the design course. OK, and uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone on YouTube for joining us. And um, we will be hopefully seeing you again for our very next session. And we'll be signing off. Tanya? Thank you very much for joining us.